Hey everybody, Jeff Schneider here. You know when you're improvising a solo and you play that note that makes everyone cringe? How about when you listen back to recordings of yourself? Does it ever sound like a random sloppy mess of note noodles? Trust me, I've been there. And I want to tell you how I got better and how I've helped my students get better too. The short answer is to practice improvising with chord tones only. Now, if you've heard this before, keep watching because I'm not only going to explain the reasons why improvising with chord tones is beneficial, but I'm also going to show you how to do it well. Because unfortunately, when many improvisers get this advice, they end up sounding kind of basic. So let's get into it. I've gone through a lot of jazz programs at schools and camps, and just about all of them placed a huge emphasis on learning scales and modes. But for some reason, the teachers completely bypassed the pedagogical method of improvising with chord tones only. And just to be clear, by chord tones, I mean the root, third, fifth, and seventh of the chords within any given progression. Now, I'm not going to say that all scales are bad. They do have their place in learning to improvise. But by focusing first on chord tones, you're going to have a much easier time playing notes that align with the chord changes. For example, if we take a basic C major 7 chord and play a C major scale over it, you'll see and hear that not all the scale degrees are equally stable. There's a spectrum of consonants and dissonance. The most consonant note is the root, followed by the 5th, 3rd, and 7th. The 2nd and 6th don't sound bad, but they're not as fundamental to the sound of the chord as 1, 3, 5, and 7. And then there's that annoying little 4th, often referred to as an avoid note, because it clashes with the 3rd, which is only a half step away. My point is that some notes will better represent the chord at hand than others. Don't get me wrong, those non-chord tones can still sound good, the truth is any note can sound good played over any chord. Some are just less user-friendly than others. It's kind of like taking a picture on your phone versus a fancy DSLR camera. If you don't know anything about shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, you're much more likely to get the picture you want by just using your camera app. To analogize the analogy, buying the fancy camera before learning the fundamentals of photography is like getting in a Ferrari without knowing how to drive. But again, there's nothing wrong with scales. It's just that when you're a beginning improviser, or even a more experienced improviser learning a difficult tune, worrying about scales can be counterproductive, especially when you consider how many scale options there are out there. That's a ridiculous amount of notes to call to mind when you're trying to improvise a solo. I highly recommend not overloading your circuits and instead focus on the four notes that actually capture the sound of the chord, root, third, fifth, and seventh. Another huge benefit of sticking to those chord tones is that by clearly outlining each chord, you'll better internalize the sound of the changes. It's one thing to understand the theory behind a series of chords on an intellectual level, but actually having the sound of a progression ingrained in your ear is what will help you get from thinking your way through a solo to hearing your way through a solo. It's the difference between having an effortless conversation with your best friend and a forced conversation with that uncle you see once every six years. But as I said before, even though learning to improvise on a tune by limiting yourself to chord tones makes a lot of sense, most people don't sound that great when they try to do it. Why is that? Well, there are a couple of reasons. When you strip away all those extra notes, it exposes many people's lack of phrasing, time, and rhythm. Anyone who's taken my courses knows my spiel about how you can play all the hippest combinations of notes you want. If your phrasing, time, and rhythm aren't happening, it all falls apart. My favorite reason for limiting yourself to chord tones is that limitations breed Creativity. Look, I know it's a challenge to make something up with only four notes, but I promise if you take on that challenge and succeed, your playing will be so much better when you fold back in the non-chord tones. You know who I think would agree with me? Ernest Hemingway. In the 1920s, the author was rumored to have taken on a similar challenge. The story goes that Hemingway's colleagues bet him that he couldn't write a complete story in just six words, to which he replied, For sale. Baby's shoes. Never worn. Thankfully, improvising with chord tones is much less depressing than Hemingway's exercise in flash fiction. But many improvisers still sound kind of sad when soloing with just chord tones. One of the main reasons is that when most improvisers think in chord tones, they end up playing this kind of thing. It's a boring arpeggio up the root position voicing of the chord. So what should you do instead? Here are some tips. Get comfortable not starting your lines on the root of the chord. It's predictable and provides less color than chord tones like the 3rd and 7th, both of which are literally referred to as color tones. You can also practice inversions of chords. A triad is usually played like this, 1-3-5. That's called root position. 
but you can also play the same three notes like this, 3-5-1, which is first inversion, or like this, 5-1-3, second inversion. Long story short, don't start your phrases on the one. The same rule applies to rhythm. Starting your phrases on beat one is also predictable. Get comfortable with the other beats in the measure. You could start on beat two, three, or four. How about the and of two, the and of three, or the and of four? There are many more possibilities, but those options I mentioned are a good place to start. No pun intended. Now here's another tactic. Change direction and skip around. In the examples I played earlier, the lines go up linearly, a series of consecutive ascending chord tones. But when you start zigzagging and skipping over adjacent chord tones, you open yourself up to so many more possibilities. Also, you don't need to play all four chord tones on every chord. It's a simple reminder, but sometimes we forget that it's okay to use a subset of the already few options at hand. Finally, the most important tip of all is to think and play compositionally. How do you come up with a solo that is melodic and not one that ends up sounding like that sloppy mess of noodles? My answer is always the same, repetition and variation. I go deep into this concept in my course, Making the Changes, but in this video, I want to do a compositional breakdown, if you will, of a chord tone solo I wrote over the jazz standard, There Will Never Be Another You. Let's look for instances of repetition and variation, as well as examples of other strategies and techniques I've covered thus far. By the way, this piece is from a new collection of etudes I've just released called Chord Tone Magic, 12 chord tone etudes over popular chord progressions will help you internalize the sound of the progressions and give you a ton of ideas of how to craft chord tone lines that are actually melodic and interesting. So here's the etude on There Will Never Be Another You. Let's start by listening to the first 16 bars. That's the first half of the form. Alright, so let's do a little bit of analysis. We're going to take a look at some of the compositional devices that I've used here, specifically relating to repetition and variation. So we're going to start on the 7, and then go down to the 3, and then repeat that again a few times. So 7 down to 3, 7 down to 3, and then it's a little bit different right in here. If you take a look at the rhythmic variation between this, this, and this, all three of these are a little bit different rhythmically, but because the pitches are the same, there's enough repetition to keep it in one grouping or one coherent idea. So it sounds like this. A one, two, three, four. One. And then on the D minor seven flat five, that D half diminished right in here, we vary the phrase and go like this. So we're going from this, to this. Pitches start to vary at this point, but the general shape of the line is intact. We're still doing that fairly large leap down there. All right, going on, we have the flat five of the D minor seven flat five, that D half diminished. And then we're just gonna hang on the G for a bit. One, 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 flat seven. Remember, these are all chord tones. And then look at this. We are back to that original shape, going down a fifth. So from the D to the G that we had here, that's a fifth, and now we have the same interval G down to C, that's also a fifth. I'm really trying to use repetition here to make this feel like a coherent solo and not just a random mess of notes. All right, now the rhythm alters again. We have this slight variation, this eighth note right here, followed by the quarter, and then another eighth. That's a pretty common rhythm, it sounds like this. One, two, three, four. All right, now we're going to build off of that idea and do it again right in here. Adding this little pickup note, that's, that's the flat third of the chord, again, just chord tones. Uh, but we're going to repeat that same rhythm, ba, ba, ba. And I feel like this one echoes what we just heard. So let me change colors here so you can see what I'm talking about. So do da da, di da da. So what's similar about those two lines? Well, specifically, it's the ends of the lines. These lines rhyme. I like to talk about lines that rhyme. I'll make another video about that in the future, about rhyming your lines, just like lyrics rhyme. But we have this descending whole step right here, and then the same thing, descending whole step. 
Going on, we have this pickup right here. Sounds like this. All right, we're anticipating the three of A flat major seven. But what I think is interesting about this pickup here is that it's the same rhythm that we had on this line and this line right here, but instead of the line going down like it does here and here, we're going up. So we have a nice little bit of contrast there, some balance to the direction of the phrases. Also, another thing that I'm thinking about right here with this C that's held out for three beats. This A flat major seven is somewhat of an arrival chord. It's a resolved chord, especially compared to the B flat minor seven and E flat seven. Those chords both have some tension in them because they are essentially leading up to this destination, this A flat major seven. So the fact that we hold the note with that C, we hold that note out for a little bit longer, that adds to that sense of arrival. The next couple of notes are similar to what we started with, that descending leap, that interval going down. It also balances out what we just heard. The line goes up here and then it comes down here. Now on to the E flat major seven, we have this repeated G again, which is gonna set up this dramatic leap up the octave. By the way, these repeated Gs are not too different from what we had here. I don't think I was uh, consciously thinking about relating those two measures, but it is related nonetheless. But yes, we have this dramatic leap up the octave, this thing right here. Landing on the flat three of C minor seven. And if I play all of this back, or at least from say this point right here, you're gonna hear how each one of these phrases is kind of building up to, to this point right here. So I know I've written a bunch on the music here, but I'm gonna play starting at this point and let's try to hear the relationship between each one of these little melodic cells, all right? So starting from the pickup into the B flat minor seven. One, two, three. Each one of these lines is birthed out of what's come before. And then we're gonna continue this idea in just a moment, but we're gonna do some fancier stuff here because we've done a lot of slower melodic movements. The rhythm has been a little bit less active in the previous four measures or so. So when we go into this next line uh, coming up here, there's a lot of activity there. And what that is going to do, uh, I hate to spill the beans here, but what it's gonna do is it's gonna set up this resolution really, really nicely. So just like we had that dramatic change right here, or that dramatic uh, arrival, um, we're going to have an even more dramatic arrival when we resolve to the G on the E flat major 7, which is uh, bar 17 halfway through the tune. But let's check out this line in here. It's all chord tones, but I'm trying to change up inversions of chords. I'm zigzagging like I was talking about before. Uh, let's check it out. It sounds like this. I'll play it um, from the pickup starting right here. A one, two, three. Aha, so that final resolution is so satisfying after all of that rhythmic tension that's built up over the previous four bars. So we have some really interesting rhythmic activity right in here. We have this phrase right here, ba, ba, da, ba, da, and then it starts on the and of four. So here it starts on beat one, then it starts on the and of four, ba, da, ba, da, da, then it starts on the downbeat of four, Ba ba do da di ba do da do da do de de do da da da. All right, so sounds crazy when I just sing it out like that. But the fact that we are starting that little five note or four or five note cell right in here and then starting it again on different parts of the measure, I was talking about this earlier about not always starting your lines on the one. I'm starting on the one, I'm starting on the and of four, I'm starting on beat four. If you vary those starting points, you're really going to be able to introduce some creativity into your playing. Also in the middle of this line, we have this classic bebop type vocabulary in there where you have that perfect voice leading of the flat seven of the F minor seven chord resolving down to the three of B flat seven. And then when we complete this line, we get to our climax. We get to the highest note we've heard thus far, the A flat. And I think that's 
positioned well because when we get to bar 17 here, you know, this is this is where we come back to the repetition of the chord progression. So the form of this tune is kind of A, A, and then there are some different chords at the very end, but at least in the beginning of these two A sections, you've got the same chord progression. You've got that E flat major seven, D half diminished, G seven. When we get to bar 17, it really feels like the, the point of arrival that we've been waiting for, and we set that up with the high A flat, and we get a nice climax there with the highest note as we land on the second half of the form, again, holding out the G just as we did earlier to accentuate that sense of arrival. All right, this video is getting a little long, so I'm gonna make the second half of my analysis available as a free video download, along with the sheet music transposed for all instruments and a backing track for you to practice along with. Click the link on the screen or in the description below to get all of that for free, and happy shedding. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next one.